Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Ultra Confusion Thursday Night Hangout. Yo, and we are here with technology that maybe actually kind of sort of possibly works. Yes, yes. I, of course, am your host, Charlie, and I'm joined once again by the prolific commoner himself, Zilius. It is good to see you again, virtually via the tubes. Yes, yes. Uh, this is a Thursday Night Hangout. This is a weekly live show where we try our best to cover the topics that are most important to you, uh, with you during the show. If you haven't yet submitted a topic, question, etc., have no fear. At any time during the show, you could drop your question, your topic, uh, into the chat, and we will try to add it to our show. If we unfortunately run out of time, we will add it to the beginning of next show. Now, this one is going to be interesting. And that, my friends, uh, actually, let's do a PSA first. COVID is still here. For those who believe that they can wait it out, go get your shot. For those out there who are who actually are, you know, private system analysis, yes, or public service announcement, Zelius. That makes much more sense. Yes. Um, wear a mask, please. Just just wear a freaking mask. Okay. Or just go get the vaccine. Do both. Uh, Sam, I'm very sorry that Battle and Brew was closed on Monday. It is a phenomenal place. Uh, and and I, I, I am very sorry that you got to miss out on the phenomenal place. Uh, okay, so let's get into the show. Let us start in the wonderful, <laughs> the wonderful state of California, where, uh, right, Eve says, still wear a mask even if you are vaccinated, which I do. <clears throat> Um, when I go everywhere, but anyways, let's start in the wonderful state of California where news after news after news has come out about the blizzard Activision or Activision blizzard, uh, I guess mounting lawsuits, oh, uh, yes. as some of you may know, there's been, uh, quite a few lawsuits that have been filed. Uh, let's see here. Here's the main filer. I have it right here. Uh, the main filer is, I had it right here, uh, the Calif uh, California's Department of Fair Employment and Housing uh, has filed a suit against Activision Blizzard uh, for 10 violations of state employment law. 10, nice. Yes. Uh, basically, here here's the deal. Oh, another Rose sighting. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, basically, they're getting... Um, they uh, have a disparity when it comes to hiring practices. Uh, they're minorities and and those that are female, transgender, binary, uh, uh, gay, uh, of dif differing races, apparently are not getting uh, the chance to work at the company, one. And two, if they do, there, there's a very high likelihood, depending on where you are in the company, that you've had uh, racist remarks, bigoted remarks, uh, uh, sexual harassment, uh, inappropriate gestures, uh, sexual assault, uh, or and uh, you know just to put the cherry on top of this, why the um, that specific board from California is involved. There's also a remarkable uh, disparity in pay between those that are male and those who are not male. Mm. And so you have all this going, of course, uh, Activision and Blizzard and specifically Blizzard has been getting just destroyed all their upper, uh, people, the CEO, the CFO, I think the CTO as well have either had allegations and uh, loss, sexual harassment lawsuits filed against them, or they are no longer with the company. Uh, now, that being said, let's talk about another lawsuit that Activision Blizzard has under their plate. That, of course, is they're being sued by their investors. Why? Mm. Because during one of their big chit chats, where they, you know, they they basically say stay the company. There was some concern about these. The, the couple of lawsuits that are popping out, they're like, oh no, you know, they're not that big of a deal. Everything's gonna be fine. And then, you know, shit just kept hitting the fan. And so 
what's happened is ever since that meeting where they're like, everything is fine, you know, we're, we're going to go back to work as usual, uh, the stock price has dipped 12%. And oh no, my money. So stockholders are uh, going, uh, we, uh, we're we suing for damages, which is their right. Um, because they, they were lied to. So we have that. Oh, and the other thing that, that's, uh, that's got Blizzard a lot of tr trouble. And apparently, I mean, this is, uh, I don't know if it's common practice, but it's very likely something that quite a few companies will have. And that is there's an arbitration clause in the contract. And what that means is that if you sign your contract, you are unable to sue the company. <clears throat> you have to go through arbitration. So that pisses off a lot of people because that really limits um, what uh, an employee can do. And also there's like some companies have uh, put in like a statute of <laughs> limitation where if you find something out, you need to tell HR immediately so they can take care of it. But apparently if HR sits on it for a couple of years, well, you know, that, empo that, that employee could be gone. They're not going to, pr that's basically another big thing is the fact that you have a bunch of individuals who have filed harassment and, and, um, uh, for whatever reason, harassment lawsuit or harassment um, complaints to HR and HR basically sat on them forever and a day. And so now that all this shit's starting to like, you know, pop up and they're not looking all rosy, they're going, well, we can't actually pursue this anymore because they're no longer with the company. Well, at the time, HR's job was to protect the company. And they probably saw it in the time as their best interest was to basically sweep it over into the rug. Yes. Because it was a whole lot easier to do that than it was to actually deal with the systemic issue that is slash was present at Blizzard. Now, um, the employees did have a walkout uh, and a signed petition basically saying, y'all need to actually get your shit together. Stop talking. Um stop talking about what you're going to do and actually tell us what you have done. Uh, Eve says statues should go to date. The complaint was first made aware. So they should still be able to request arbitration. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, and also to be honest with you, and uh, this is probably, you know, uh, true with a lot of companies is the, the higher up you are, the, the more, uh, crazy it is to actually getting actions done to that person. I mean, that's why the CEO, uh, of Blizzard. And then of course, uh, Zealy said, I found this, uh, after the show, I don't know if it's last week or the week before, but there was, there's an infamous, uh, picture, which is now being called the Cosby room picture where oh, yeah. a bunch of the, uh, uh, I'm gonna, the picture features a, uh, a room full of, uh, Caucasian men lying on a bed that has a pic a big picture of Bill Cosby sitting right there, and everyone's kind of just like ooing and awing over it. Um, so you know that's not good. That's basically idolizing Bill Cosby for what he did, and of course that's a no no, a big no no. Now, one of the things that they that this is one thing that I do find interesting, and and actually I, I'm okay with this, is that they Blizzard is trying to push, and I, see I understand why companies wouldn't do this, but I think it, that they should. Blizzard they're they're being pushed to, um, to publish the pay scale for the employees, so that they have a full understanding of what they should be making. Now, of course, once you publish that, that means that all your competitors could see that and they could try to uh, steal talent away from you because they know, you know, if, if there's like a shining, a rising star in Blizzard, they'd be like, we'll, you know, we'll go right outside what that person's pay bracket is, uh, you know, and maybe we'll, we'll, you know, we'll put something, uh, uh, an incentive and we'll steal them. 
Well, it's also a common way to suppress pay within your own company. Right. Because if I, you know, most companies, you're strongly encouraged not to talk about your pay. And so if Charlie and I both work for Ultra Confusion and we both basically do the same job and he's making $10,000 more than me, and I don't know that, then I'm just going about my merry day. And all of a sudden the information is published. It's like, oh, wait a second. I want to make $10,000 more because we're doing the same job. Therefore, I should make the same amount of money. Exactly. And to be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen, if you do work at a company, there is nothing wrong. I mean, some people will not tell you their, how much they're getting paid a year, but there's nothing wrong about conversing about it and making sure that you're on equal footing. If you have, if, if you, if you work with the company, um, uh, I'm actually just going through this right now. Uh, they've got different tiers. Uh, for specific jobs. So they've got like, let's just say um, IT director. And then they have an IT director tier one, tier two, and tier three. And so tier one is basically zero to at most four years. Then you go four to uh, nine years, and then 10 plus is the tier three. So they give you all the pay ranges and all that stuff. But because they've now shown that, now you've got people going, well, wait a minute. I've been here for a long time, and I, I'm not in that bracket. That's why eventually, like, if you work at like some a lot of public school districts, they publish what you're making. And so it's you at least know, you know, based on what you do, depending on your degrees, depending on your years, you know what you're going to be paid. There's no right. ambiguity. Um, well, for that matter, the negotiations, it's right. You know, here's your pay scale. And there are some benefits to that, like from an employee perspective, I think, as far as just being super straightforward. Um, I mean, to me, the idea of negotiating while I'm employed at a company for my salary is like, I hate that part. Yeah. Um, like pay me what I'm worth. Agreed. Uh, Eve says that's why it shouldn't be tied to years of experience, but job title and performance. Yes and no, because then you get get boxed in with if there is not a a title increase for your career path. That's why they broke it into tiers for you know, and then gave you years of experience, which is very vague. Because let's say that technically, uh, with with the way that it's written, uh, it just says. 10 years of IT director experience. Well, you might be the IT director there for four years, but you were with another company for 15. So technically you have 19 years of experience. But if done right, I would actually rather be paid on performance than years because oh, right. years is not necessarily indicative of your skill. But then again, when, when it comes down to performance, you're, you're at the mercy of your boss, your manager, whatever, you're higher up. And them uh, basically highlighting what you've done to the further upper management. Well, that's why it's important to have correct rubrics in place so that if done right, that your manager cannot game the system in such a way, or there's ways to deal with that, which obviously not all places have in place. That I mean, that's a major thing in education. Is in education, how do you do performance pace, performance based uh, scales for pay? Uh, it's extremely, any way you slice it, it's really hard to measure. I do um, recall, and, and I will not mention the name, that there was a gentleman who was a teacher. He's no longer a teacher, as far as I know. Uh, that there was an incentive at the school to to basically improve your uh, student passing rate, overall passing rate for the year. So let's just say... I'm just going to say uh, the first year he was a teacher there, 70%. Yep. Uh, second year, uh, it was 78%. So there's a little bit of an increase. So he gets an incentive bonus before that. The next year, either the kids find, you know, are getting it or maybe you know he, he stumbled upon a beautiful formula, but 90% uh, pass, right? So he gets an incentive bonus. The next year, he has 78% pass. He gets penalized. Yep. Or the, or the way that happens too is if you become one of those teachers who get your teacher passing at 95%, mm -hmm. 
some school districts will do it based on increasing your passing rate. Right. So if you're at 95%, statistically speaking, how do you increase that versus if I'm a teacher with 68% passing rate, that's relatively speaking easier to pass. Right. So that's what makes it very complicated from that perspective um, is how do you do that from a teaching perspective? Um, and, you know, how do you do the, it's just hard. I don't know what the answer is. Um, different school districts have definitely tried different ways of doing it. And you get, you know, teachers teaching um, AP students versus, you know, kids with special needs. It's rudimentary English. Uh, yeah, history versus English. I teach that, you know, uh, affluent schools versus inner city schools, Title mm -hmm. II schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's so many, you know, parent involvement. There's an insane amount of factors outside of a teacher's control that they have zero control over, literally. Um, it, so that's what makes it so freaking difficult to do that from a education perspective. So Eve uh, has chimed in. It's important to have direct open conversations with your manager about performance and expectations. If your manager is clear and concise on expectations, then they have a, a clear argument if you feel you aren't getting the performance rating you expect. So that's one of my coworkers. He used to work for a big time Fortune 500 company. Mm -hmm. He talks about it all the time, but they have like clear metrics. Um, so just for instance, like, let's say like IT, this is, I'm just kind of pulling this one of my ass, okay. but like IT, you know, part of our job is to clear tickets, right? Right. Statistically speaking, let's just say there's 10 people in the IT help desk. Statistically speaking, over the span of 365 days, it'll average out as far as who has like the easy tickets versus the hard tickets. So if your company's expectation is you clear 10 tickets a day and, you know, eight of your employees are clearing 12 a day, and two of them are clearing only eight a day, mm -hmm. then that becomes a pretty clear potential case of, well, the eight who are clearing 12 a day, they're doing something right. But the ones who are only clearing eight a day are not. And in theory, you also have the evidence. So those ones who are clearing eight a day can be like, well, I had these tickets that right. took this long because of X, Y, Z reason. So to Eve's point, the manager can be like, you know what, you're right, we can do that. But in theory, you have that data to back it up either way. So they can be like, this is the tickets you cleared. That's your raise because you did not or did meet expectations. Uh, but the question is, do you have those rubrics in place? I mean, we know a lot of IT places that don't even have a proper help tech, help desk system. And so how do you measure metrics if you don't even have that data to analyze in the first place? Or... Uh... The, you may be clearing several tickets, but to your manager, the area in which you're, uh, the tickets that you're taking care of are in an area that they do not find important. So let's say that you're working IT or, or service desk. Let's say that you have uh, computers, uh, internet, telephony, and um, I don't know, drivers. Yeah. And you are just a freaking whiz when it comes to telephony. But for some reason, like, well, no one used their telephone. So why would you do 12 tel telephony tickets when people need, you know, internet access? Well, of course, if the telephony is, well, actually, whatever. But that, that then you get penalized for that because in their mind, they have a scale of importance that may not match up to the actual scale of importance of what needs to actually be taken care of. Well, that's what I would think that part of the should be at least more cut and dry in that you almost know before the pay year even starts, what your metrics are. Like, so you know, to your point, the telephony, maybe you are working at, you know, old confusion company where we don't put a priority on telephony. So if your importance is telephony, maybe it's not the place for you, but I think the key is, you know, that metric ahead of time. It's not a surprise when you get to the end of the quarter and you're looking at your raise and also it's like, oh, wait, you didn't tell me that telephony is only weighted at 75% of my total metric until now. Hopefully that's something that you knew ahead of time so that either you can, you know, look for a new employer or adjust your kind of ticket allocations. Um, but Let's just say I look for a new employer. <laughs> Come on, telephony master. Well, I didn't have anything with telephony. I just, I just named 
I, I work at a university, so I was just trying to think of things that a university serv- uh, uh, help desk would have to deal with. But, anyways, um, so here's exact. I we're just let me wrap, let me loop back real quick. Um, the the main focus of what uh, Blizzard Act Activision Blizzard's employees are looking for, and and I I agree with basically we've already touched on most of it, but I just want to go back over real quick. Is that um, uh, they're asking management to work with them to develop new recruiting practices, publish employee pay rates and undertake third-party audits to improve staff diversity and prevent harassment. That one should be common sense, that last one. But at the same time, I, I'm i almost 100% sure that there are so many companies that are afraid to air their dirty laundry, and they don't want a third party in there mucking around with stuff. Because they might, maybe there is something that they thought they would be able to get away with. Uh, that when you have someone from outside looking through stuff, that that practice will have to go away. Yeah, I, I mean that's kind of crazy to me that that had to be part of almost like their three pillars. That hey, not only diversity but also harassment. Like mm-hmm. harassment is so endemic of their culture mm-hmm. that you need a third party auditor to come in there to kind of clean up that mess. It's obviously a higher up. I think you brought up a good point earlier of, you know, if I'm the CEO, mm-hmm. what is HR going to do? I mean, it's like, right. Uh, I signed your paycheck. Yeah. Good luck, you know, bringing a complaint against me. Um, and that's, I mean, how many whistle, I mean, you see the news all the time where, you know, they, the theory is whistleblower blowers are supposed to be, you know, kind of protected in that they can't be retaliated against. Uh, but I think we've seen time and time again where that's not true. Right. Where, you know, through whatever methods or means, the employers absolutely can and do retaliate against it. And, you know, if you're a small, small Joe, what do you do against the EA? Like, are you going to sue them in their, you know, legion of lawyers? Right. That's the, um, that's the other thing. Yeah. It's just like, it's, it's the, I mean, it, I'm not saying that it's, it's the exact same, but but uh, a great way, as Delius was putting, is it's you're if you're going after a big bad company, uh, what happens a lot with a big bad company, especially when it comes to like smaller companies trying to you know step up to the plate against a big bad company, all they got to do is just keep throwing money at you until you can't pay for it, and then you have to either settle or they win. And so I would not be surprised if they try to take that approach. Or, of course, I'm sure that they, that that uh, there's billions of smear campaigns to try to, you know, water down someone's complaints about a specific person, especially a high-ranking person. Or, of course, you could do the the shell game, which is, uh, well, he's no longer the CEO of the company. He's now a chief uh, uh, technology officer of our Australian branch. And I mean, unfortunately, what do you do? Like, let's just take, like, I work at a, you know, school, about 120 employees. Mm-hmm. And the reality is, and I'll preface this, none of this is actually going on. This is purely hypothetical. Okay. But let's just say there was a teacher who was harassing me, right? Like, right. every day is coming in. And let's just say I went to my boss. Mm-hmm. And I went to his boss. I'm like, hey, this situation is happening. You know, this Charlie dude, you just give me a hard time. If they don't do anything about it, and they're just like, well, good luck, deal with it. Like, honestly, like, what could I do? I mean, you know, and that's, and that's kind of the case to your point. That's a lot of small companies. Like you don't really have an alternative if your, you know, CEO basically doesn't care. Like, what do you really do as an employee? There's really nothing you can do. I mean, I guess in theory, you could go to like, you know, your state. Who's the guy who's in charge of like employee relations? I know there's like a state. Uh, It's a labor, um. Yeah, you know, like yeah. the theory, I guess there's people you go to, but really for the most part, like either you, I mean, unfortunately, either you suck it up um, or you go find a job elsewhere, which sucks, but I'm not really sure what the alternative is. Um, I mean, thankfully, you know, I myself work at a place where that's not an issue and I know I could go to my bosses and be like, this is screwed up and it'll get dealt with. But I, reality is most or a lot of people don't work in situations like that. Right. Um, 
or they work in, you know, cultures or work environments um, where it's endemic. I mean, that's a big thing with, you know, one thing we really try to push is like STEM for girls because STEM and engineering fields become boy zones. And so if you're, that's one of the big issues in those fields. If you're like one of the lone females in like engineering and all the guys are of the same mindset and you complain about them basically being, you know, male jack wagons, but nobody else sees anything wrong with it, then that's really hard to change that culture. And for those kids out there who are wondering, I'm pretty sure you know, but STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Indeed. Uh, Eve says, uh, you can always file an EEOC complaint in your state. What is EEOC complaint? I have no idea what that is. I am going to Google it. I'm not sure. I'm going to the Googleplex. Uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Now, does that apply to private employers too? So like I work for, for instance, in my case, I technically work for a religious institution. So in my case, can I, like, are we, is basically my institution exempt from EEOC complaints? I would believe it'd be any, it's, I would believe it's any, uh, yes, all employees. That's what I was going to say. I, I, I would have been under the impression that any employer, no matter if it's in the private or public sector, uh, would have to fall underneath these guidelines. Now, uh, Zelius did mention uh, something about, you know, if you're a smaller uh, developer and how it gets harder. And there was actually a story that came out. Uh, there's a, there is a developer out there called Fulbright, and they made this phenomenal game called uh, Gone Home. Uh, I love the crap out of this uh, game when I played it. But um, it turns out one of the co-finders founders, Steve Gaynor, um, basically, okay, so there, there's a problem with this gentleman. And the problem is um, that the the work environment was controlling a place in which staffers felt undermined and demeaned by Gaynor because of Gaynor's status as the co-founder of a beloved indie darling. Some former employees said they were worried about being blacklisted in the industry though some ended up leaving the industry entirely anyways. For, former employees said that they did not experience, let's see, uh, they did not experience or witness sexual harassment or explicit sexism. Instead, they said the studio's toxic culture hid behind the veneer of inclusivity as women were allegedly repeatedly broken down by microaggressions. Mm. So that that's another that's 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 another uh card that you know the the higher uppers can do. If if you don't want to play ball, we'll blackball you, which of course or blacklist you, which means that you're put on a list of do not touch this person is toxic. Mm -hmm. Um So that's a question. So with companies like this mm -hmm. or you know, we're talking about Blizzard, mm -hmm. I'm not even talking about like, you know, um, blacklisting them from yourselves or boycotting, but like, do you put a do games from them take on a different meaning to you? And maybe like a good example is like, um, let's just say you still play World of Warcraft, right? It's a Blizzard yep. game. Yep. Would you feel differently if you're a World of Warcraft player, knowing what went on with Blizzard? Um, and would you be like less inclined or do you think that affects your kind of view of playing their video games? Maybe World of Warcraft is not a great example because it's the monthly pay scale. So there's directly but still the head of World of Warcraft got nailed. So maybe like over, maybe Overwatch is actually better because Overwatch you've already paid, like I've already paid my $60 for Overwatch, right? Mm -hmm. So really Blizzard's not getting money from me. So in a game like that, where you've already paid for it, do you feel any differently playing a game like that? And like, man, I'm not sure I want to play this game as much because it's not even I'm monetarily supporting them. It's that like I'm philosophically supporting them now. Or do you kind of be like, you know what? It's a game. I've already played it. I don't think either one's right or wrong. I'm just kind of curious. Right. No, I mean, this is this is basically the same type of question where as um, once all the dirt about Harvey Weinstein came out or all the dirt about Kevin Spacey came out. 
do you still watch Weinstein movies or Kevin Spacey movies? And my answer is, I don't know. I, I mean, um, I think in the case of Kevin Spacey, I think that's a that's probably on the deep end in that you're associated with the face. You right. Know what I mean, it's like I think in that case, I would say that's probably like on the far scale of like easy to feel squirmy about and that you see Kevin Spacey and you get that visceral like visual reaction. Right. Harvey Weinstein, I would think it's like somewhere in the middle because like once you started that movie, you don't see him. Right. It's, it's only in the Overwatch, if you see his logo at the beginning. Versus Overwatch is like at the far end because once you're in, like you don't even, I mean, you probably actually do see the Blizzard logo somewhere. But like once you start it, it's like Blizzard's not even a part of it. So it's almost like separations of like our caught like conscious thinking about the actions of these companies or people. Right. You're right. You're it's it's uh, out of sight, out of mind uh, yeah. after a certain point. Uh, a quick side note about Overwatch. Overwatch just lost um, T-Mobile as a sponsor because of all of this craziness. I am. Um, isn't that one of their huge sponsors too? Yeah. But if here, here's the deal. You want change. You want companies to start paying attention. You got them hit them in the wallet. Uh, as much as I would love to say that, you know, people, uh, you know, with all this crap, they should, you know, boycott or, or, you know, um, you know, uh, limit, you know, time length ban, all of blizzard stuff. But the, the, the fact of the matter is there are a lot of people who are exactly like the individuals who are in trouble. Um, uh, not in trouble who are guilty. Uh, <laughs> and so they don't give a shit. Uh, you got those people who are like, well, I are, they already got my money. So, you know, I'll keep playing the game. Um, but I have heard that, um, that because of all of this action, there has, especially on the blizzard side of the house, that all the, the teams, the, the developers, QA artists, all that stuff, they ain't, their um their release schedules all kinds of jacked because they are under so much stress they're not getting anything done um like a, in a perfect world you know there there needs to be a monetary a, a high enough monetary um uh, uh penalty for this kind of crap and not just a slap on the wrist and and not just having a promissory note of will change Mm -hmm. well, um, you know, like Blizzard, where they are, it's World of Warcraft. I mean that that's that's really the only thing that Blizzard still is keeping in the flow. To be honest, I mean people are over Overwatch. Diablo two is Diablo two again, the same game. Um, Diablo four, I don't know if it's still on a cell phone or what the hell the deal is. I'm not. Uh, uh, it's really World of Warcraft. Yep. I mean, you know, if people. You know, if there's going to be a stand against Blizzard and really hit them where it hurts, and that's where it is. That's what makes Blizzard still function. I would, you know, actually, uh, I'll I'll look this up after the show. But I'd be very interested to see, since all this stuff started happening in July, mm -hmm. uh, what the what the population of uh, active WoW players is. If it has seen uh, any type of you know uh, noticeable. Um, uh, decline. Well, the one thing I've seen is um, streamers. Mm -hmm. Is major streamers. I mean, that's one of the major metrics nowadays, which is kind of crazy to say of a popular game, is the number of streamers. Yep. Um, and that's where I, I have seen, I think for, you know, you think about if you're a streamer, part of your following fan base is kind of the cultural identity and i i don't think streamers they're not expected to take stands on things like they're out there for the politics and et cetera et cetera uh, but i think a lot of the streamers it's that's a pretty straightforward one and if they already have a following they could probably jump you've seen a lot of, there's been a lot of streamers you've seen over the years where they i think we've seen they can go from game to game successfully and still yeah. keep that following. People seem to not really follow streamers for the games. It's because they're interesting personalities that for whatever reason they're following finds endearing. Right. So I think that's in a case of like a game like World of Warcraft. Um, and everything I've read is 
Wilds become stale anyways because Blizzard's not really releasing anything. Uh, so I, I wonder why. Just to hit them. Maybe they're spending all their money on something else. Touche. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I do want to pump the brakes here real quick because, uh, as you know, every single week we want to thank all the amazing friends of the show, um, those beautiful individuals who who helped us out. Uh, so without further ado, let's go down the list here. And the first one, of course, is the Indie Cluster. The Indie Cluster is an organization of independent game developers that want to gain exposure by being involved in the community. They collectively journey to popular conferences as a traveling booth to help gain attention for their games. They make partnerships in local communities to bring games to the mainstream mindset. They highlight local, unusual, and rare concepts to challenge the paradigm of the common. They also host events to teach kids and minority groups about game development to hopefully one day enter the industry themselves. If you'd like more information, go to andycluster.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-C-L-U-S-T-E-R dot com. Um, <laughs> no, Sam, I'm not saying that. Um. Sam's making inappropriate words here. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, uh, the next one, of course, is uh, is the new kid on the block, and that, of course, is, ladies and gentlemen, we also want to do a quick shout-out for Noodle Boy Media. Founded in 2015 by Andrew Tran, Noodle Boy Media, previously Whacked 40 Kids, Whacked Kid 47 Media is your choice for professional photo shoots and panel recordings at conventions. They pride themselves in providing a high level of professionalism, top-notch experiences, and quality services. If you want more information and to view their full list of services, check out facebook.com slash noodleboymedia. And of course, we got to talk about the one... The only, the legendary, Hero Chiropractic. Hero Chiropractic is a unique healthcare practice set up by Ryan Moore. The company's focus on ele- company's focus to elevate a patient's experience of freedom, creative expression, and joy. They believe that everyone can be a hero and has incredible heroic potential inside themselves, waiting to be unleashed. Hero Chiropractic focuses on mobile chiropractic care in the greater Atlanta area. They are committed to healing clients by creating a plan of action uniquely suited for each person. They make that plan of action as convenient and affordable as possible, and most importantly, suited to your individual needs. If you want more information, go to HeroChiropractic.com. And since we did our uh, friends of the show, I do want to uh, do a couple of... uh, I guess, public service announcements. So Zilly starts to get confused by me saying PSA again. I'm always confused. I know. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, I do want to turn your attention to the fact that Alter Confusion is proud to say that we have been fundraising for Extra Life for 10 years straight. Extra Life is gamers doing what they do best, gaming, to help sick and injured children at their chosen children's Miracle Network Hospital. The money that we raise through Extra Life will go directly to our chosen hospital, which of course is Children's Healthcare Atlanta, as unrestricted funds. This means that the hospital decides where and how to spend the money to ensure the dollars we raise make the biggest impacts in the lives of the kids they treat. So if you have the capacity to donate, please go to extra-life.org and search for Altered Confusion. And of course, if you do not have the... uh, the capacity, financial capacity to donate, uh, but you do want to be part of Extra Life. Go to extra-life.org and you can find out um, all the information about maybe setting up your own goal or perhaps joining a team. And I do, I do want to stress this. It doesn't have to be video gaming. There is a ton of people out there who do board gaming and uh, pencil and paper RPGing. Uh <laughs> Sam Grizzle, Belly Brew, closed on Mondays, regardless if it's your only free day in Atlanta. Like, some some of these, re- I'm, I'm going to be totally honest with you. Some of the restaurants and, and some of these, like, businesses have the weirdest ass days that they take off. There's, I can't remember, there's some place that's, like, super popular uh, in Atlanta. I think it's a 
bar, and they they will not ever open on a Tuesday. Doesn't matter what the hell is happening in the world, it's closed on a Tuesday. Anyways, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I do also, uh, you just previously saw the Friends of the Show, and if you're interested in becoming a Friends of the Show, uh, or helping out Alter Confusion in another way, ladies and gentlemen, Alter Confusion has a Patreon. Uh, Alter Confusion survives on the love and support of fans like you. And so we have a Patreon page. Patreon allows you, the fans, supporters, lovers, haters, aliens, monsters, vampires, werewolves, uh, celestial beings, and whatever else you are out there, all inclusive, uh, to become active participants in the work we love through a monthly membership. This will give you access to exclusive content, community, and insight into our creative process. In exchange, we gain a bit more freedom to do our best work and the stability we need to build an even stronger creative career. So, ladies and gentlemen, there are two uh, tiers. Uh, there, uh, as I stated, it is a monthly donation. Uh, there's a $1 tier, which would be $12 a year. Uh, that tier will allow you to have early access to all the playthroughs and will allow you to take part in polls and uh, be privy to uh, first first announcements before the public gets to know. Uh, the next tier is the $5 tier, which was $60 a year. And that is the tier that you need to be to have your name or organization added to our thank you section uh, for all th uh, Thursday night hangouts. Uh, of course, it'll give you the early access to the playthroughs and the ability to partake in polls. If you're interested, go to patreon.com slash ultra confusion. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash ultra confusion. Yes, my, my thanks gets longer and longer every single time. I think I just need to make a list of it so I could get it straight because I have to ramble off. I, oh, I forgot ghost inspectors and ghouls and zombies. Where cats. Um, but anyways, uh, please be a patron for Alter Confusion. The money that we raise helps us to go to conventions, to upkeep our equipment, to allow us to do what we're doing. For those out there who are patrons, uh, you will notice that I just gave you access to a brand new playthrough, uh, for the game, The Beast Inside, which, uh, I'm just going to warn you, I, I did... Uh, yell and scream in fright quite a few times. Um, but uh, you, uh, everyone probably noticed the fact that there was another playthrough that was also published, but this one was for the public, not just for patrons. Uh, and that was a game called Luna the Shadow Dust. Yeah, uh, which is also another great game. Um, I'm trying, like I said, I've been trying to you know ramp everything up, and so here's for me trying to ramp things up. Now, uh, I'm going to do this uh, last part just for Sam, because I know Sam loves this, and that is, ladies and gentlemen, if you if you cannot do a financial uh, type of support for Alter Confusion, but you want to give something to Alter Confusion to show your love and support, perhaps um, you have a, a unique T-shirt, a coffee mug, Funko Pop, whatever, all you need to do is mail it to 1551. Dunwoody, that's D-U-N-W-O-O-D-Y, Village Parkway, number, this is super duper important, number 88276. If you not include that, that means that you're not sending it to our P.O. box, you're sending it to the, the post office and it will be returned to you. The city, once again, is Dunwoody, D-U-N-W-O-O-D-Y, Georgia, zip code is 30338. You're welcome, Sam. <laughs> now, for a little bit of different news, and Zelius is going to be absolutely 100% shocked by this news. Late breaking news, ladies and gentlemen. I want to tell you that Amazon has delayed its MMO New World again. <laughs> so the real question is, is it going to be a situation like Cyberpunk 2077, where it's indefinitely going to be broken, and no amount of time fixes it? Or are they going the old school, pre-crazy Blizzard route? where they delayed the game because they actually want to come out with a finished, decent, good product. I hope it's the later because I did beta test. Uh, New World. It was, actually, it was actually an alpha test. Um, New World a couple months ago, and I really thought it was a cool game. Mm -hmm. um, from the gathering to the crafting 
to the combat. I, I think it's a quality game that has a lot of potential to have really I think one of the challenges with the MMOs is not just grabbing people for that initial, you know, spike in 10 million players. I'm just throwing on numbers. It's not going to actually have 10 million players, but actually keeping a decent percentage of those 10 million players for time, not mm -hmm. just, you know, that initial week. Mm -hmm. um, I think I do see a lot of like the influx of like the Korean MMOs is the big and flashy and cool combat, but then it becomes super predative and you're doing the same thing, pressing the same four keys for, 60 levels it's like okay that's boring um and i think that's something that new world can actually get around between the different things and different ways you can do the combat and the gathering and the crafting there's just a lot of interesting things to do in the game um that feel like that kind of fully fledged mmo mm -hmm. uh and i hope they do that i think there's always that fear though of the um cash shop um creep and that when I played New World, it also is very player. The players put a lot of resources of time into the game to feel like they accomplished something. Um, and that, you know, when you're doing your gathering and you're crafting, you do get that sense of accomplishment from like you actually did something useful in the game, which I think is cool. Um, you know, it's very much the tried and true carrot approach of MMOs. But I think a lot of those players that they put in those hours, if you get those new players who come in and everybody's over the cash shop, we get it. There's going to be a cash shop in the game. Every MMO has it. Hell, it, every single player game even has cash shops nowadays. Mm -hmm. But is that cash shop just meant for cool bling and I can look schnazzy? Or is it going to be the you know cash shop that gets me my instant sort of plus 1,000 power? that I spent hundreds of hours getting and this Joe Schmo got over here in five minutes. I think that's always the worry with the MMO, which is truly online, where you have online PVE and PVP, how does that creep into the game um, is always a worry. And I know and part of New World is also immersion. And I know there's an uproar where there's a recently released pet. It's a rainbow lion. And New World, it's very much a, it sounds like it is. It's kind of set in the era of like, you think about like America, New World, you know, beginning of the muskets, mm -hmm. you can still use the bow and arrow. It very much has that feel of the frontier. Um, in the way the lands are all built, you know, it feels that way. And also, it, it very is very much a much immersive game in that way. And all of a sudden, you, fly, you like throw in a very bright flying rainbow lion from the cash shop mm -hmm. and it's like what so well, i think that's the fear of the game is is that cash grab that they're gonna obviously try to do because they want to make money off of it going to also break what people feel like is that immersion of the game which i think is a large draw of it honestly so i mean well, i'm still interested in it um at this point i'm gonna wait to see what the previews look like when it comes out mm -hmm. uh, you know if it's if the reviews are like it still was kind of that alpha beta that i played then i'll get it but if it's like everything has changed and it's terrible now then i'm like awesome mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so uh ladies and gentlemen i know that you love to hear uh the dulcet tones of Zelius's voice. So I'm going to let Zelius do the next one again, and I'm going to just state it, and then Zelius is going to give you all his amazing opinions on it. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been announced, DragonCon 2021 won't allow non-attendees to watch the annual parade. All I can ask is how? I I mean, how? It's on the street. It's on the roads. Like It's not just on the road. It's like It's not just like a one block parade that you know you can like okay we can like you know gate off this one block it's like across like six city blocks of downtown atlanta and it's like snaking it's not like just one single it's i don't know how you actually block i mean i think about the logistics and the manpower yeah that you would need because even if like they put gate like the little stanchion gates up, people are just going to hop it unless you have like 8,000 volunteers slash police people there to like prevent it in the number of people that it takes to prevent it defeats the entire purpose. Um, I, 
I, Let's see here. I, I, I just pulled up a map of, uh, this is the, okay, so this is the 2019 uh, map here. It starts, let's see if I can pull it up here. It starts on Linden Avenue. Uh, it's one block, two blocks, three blocks, goes over the connector. Uh, I have an Allen. That's another, what's that? We're on six blocks now. Uh, seven blocks, eight blocks, nine blocks, 10 blocks, 11, 12, 13, when you end up in front of the Marriott in Hyatt. <laughs> There's and, no way. There's no way. And I still don't remember seeing anything about um, like a actual kind of uh, like COVID policy as far as like vaccinations and stuff like that. Like I know they had like Lollapalooza last week, I think. And I remember like to get to that, you either A, had to be vaccinated or B, have a negative COVID vaccine test within like the last three days, mm -hmm. uh, which, okay, they did something. Um, so that's really kind of interested to see like what is, oh wait, they actually, hmm. Well, as Zelius is looking over this stuff, uh, Zelius um, kind of hinted at there's 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 other conventions and uh, concerts and and whatever's expositions uh, that have come out with their COVID policy. One of them, of course, the the one that shares the exact same weekend as DragonCon. That, of course, is PAX West, which some may know as PAX Prime. Apparently, the the nickname they're going with is. Uh, Pax Vax, um, and that is uh, prior to entry. You will now it will now be required. You will now have to have proof of a completed COVID nineteen vaccination series or a negative COVID nineteen PCR or antigen antigen test, each to be verified with a valid government issued ID. So apparently, for Dragon Con, they're now requiring to wear face masks inside the convention centers. They don't have. They don't have a choice. I know, but like the the mayor stomped, uh, put her foot down and said, "Anything inside the city limits, you got to wear a mask." Uh, so the interesting one to me, which might actually change my participation level, to be honest, uh -huh. is they're going to reduce capacity from prior years, which on one hand makes total sense. I get yep. it. Like you can't have as many people inside. Right. But at the same time, like the lines to get into things like America's Mart and all of the panels have got longer and longer every year with like literally you can't breathe capacity to start with. So so, so how like, much of a reduction are they going to do? I know. Well, they did say like so they didn't say for America's Mart, but they did say for um, like the Walk of Fame is two thirds capacity. Of normal capacity, which okay, they probably but need like, to do a third instead of two thirds. Uh, so is that going to like make the lines to get into this place like insanely long versus just long? So that's kind of the other part of it too. And if you think about it, like when you're in line for like these panels and other stuff, like you're you know shoulder to shoulder. There ain't no social distancing. Yep, and like. Are they going to request you social distance in line and be six feet apart? Which now it's going to make these lines like wrap around the Marriott like eighteen times instead of once. Uh, that that's. I did see that they're not doing single day Saturday passes, so that's something. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to to look at. I'm trying to browse the site as as fast as I can on on the side here. Well, they have the, just the general update one. Um, so it looks like everything is being reduced to two thirds um, room capacity, not just the um, walk of fame. So, like every panel. I don't know how how are you gonna how are you gonna police that? Are you just gonna like you're gonna have someone that counts the the number of people in the line? They and already then... do that. Yeah. So any panel they had like in previous years. They already had the person like, I mean, there, there's a person, there was the volunteer. I remember in line, 
and they would click as they went through line to count the number of people. And what they would do is when you get relatively towards like, let's just say it's at a thousand people. When they started getting to around that 900th person, they would start to warn you. And I remember they're like, Hey, this might be the cutoff. You can try to get in, but we don't know. Um, and once they got past that, like there's a certain point where they basically just kick you out of the line. It's just like, you're not getting in. So my guesses will be the same type of thing with the two thirds thing. Just instead of stopping at 1000, they just know it's 700 and that's past 700. They're just going to not even let you in line because there's no point. You can have so many freaking campers. I mean, you already did. I mean, to your point, you already did. Um, yeah, it's you're good. The thing is, okay. So you're going to be able to cap the, the, the line which is gonna still gonna be long as shit for some of these panels, but then you're gonna have like this, you know, uh, group of individuals who are gonna be huddled together in mass off the side, knowing that the, as soon as that panel goes in, they gotta get in line for the next one. Yep. So you're gonna have this like, you know, a bunch of people probably break a protocol because you need to leave. Uh, like, a, you know, a, a, an aisle or uh, some way for people to keep going, you know, traffic. Well, part of it, too, was always not just the panels, but like just the, you know, milling around and the hanging out the Marriott and the different hotels, not even in the actual panels, but just like where they had the concerts because they were a lot of the concerts, they're not actually like in a room. Yep. They're just like in the foyer of yep. the hotels. Uh, or a lot of like the really good cosplay stuff is up in the atrium of the Marriott. And they never did attendance for those. It was just, come on in. Mm -hmm. um, so like, are they going to have basically like cues to get into those now too? Because um, I mean, I think I, like when we were at the Marriott, like you're literally like, breathing on the person's neck in front of you before yep. if they're going to try to have any kind of social distancing like you're talking much less than two-thirds capacity for that oh yeah and to your point it's also the issue isn't just the like i'm thinking of specifically the marriott atrium you have the panel rooms inside the marriott there mm -hmm. that go through the atrium for your lines mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which makes things even more chaotic um, I, look, I I had a fan table uh, for two Dragon Cons, and I was in, I can't remember which one I was in. I was in one of the Marriott's, I think. And I was kind of shoved into the back. Uh, but there was constantly lines that, that kind of blocked off most of that fan section because people were trying to get into those panels. Then you cut. Then you then you also deal with individuals that are interacting with the fan tables or, or your organization tables or whatever. Um, you know. So yeah, it, I I'll be very interested to see. I will say, like for the most, I mean, obviously there's always exceptions. Yeah. My experience at least, Dragon Con was pretty good about leasing the lines as far as those like long lines. Um, and I think part of it was personal. Like if you were already in line, because it's like the Matt Smith panels, for instance, right? Like you're usually there for like a good half hour to hour. You didn't yep. want that jackass also getting in front of you and calling the line. Yep. <laughs> right. So like there was also a little bit of like, no, dude, I've been standing in line for an hour. You can do the same thing. So I think there's always been that bit of policing already. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a logistical nightmare. Is what it's gonna I, be. I don't, I don't think you could get away with this, but I know in previous years, what, uh, Pax did was they had uh, for what like any of the like the really big panels that were going to be you know in the, the humongous rooms they would actually have a another room that would start the line for not the upcoming panel but the one after that. Oh wow! Yeah. So you didn't have like this mad rush of people trying to get first in line, but you know you're you're still shoving a bunch of people into a room. <laughs> For an hour. You can do that for Dragon because if you think about Dragon Con, like all of the room, I mean, there's probably other rooms I don't know about, obviously, but yeah. there's like, you think about like the ball rooms, mm -hmm. the lines in the past would snake through the 
four years and basically go out the back entrance yep. outside. Yep. So I'm not really sure. I don't think there's really other places to queue without defeating the entire purpose of socially distancing. In the first. I, I think that's the key. Yeah. Is you could find space inside to queue them to avoid it, but then you're just going to actually make things worse COVID-wise potentially. Agreed. Um, and, you know, most of the lines already did queue to start outside. So, like, I don't know where you would queue again outside with how it was in the past. Parking that lot. That would happen sometimes with some of the, like, some of the big panels. I remember, like, they would start queuing before the next one because you wanted to be there. The Marriott Marquis parking deck. Just start there and just have them walk up the stairs. No parking at the uh, <laughs> parking at the parking deck this year. It is now the queuing zone. Exactly. You will now be walking a mile to your panels. Weren't you already doing it if you were having a bounce between buildings? <laughs> well, yes, you're right. Like once you had to like wrap around the building four times and. Actually, it wasn't like the distance, like as the crow flies. Yeah. In fact, you'd be walking like around the building to get back through the queue. That's what yep. forever. Yep. Yeah. Um, I felt like I had one more topic I wanted to bring up, but I'm now blanking here. Um, there was a question uh, that was asked to me today, uh, and I, knowing that we had to talk about the the Blizzard Activision stuff, I I knew I was not gonna be able to to give you the full love and support of this question. So I'll, I'll hold off till next week. So you can look forward to, um, the question was asked, uh, you see all these online games, a lot of this like competitive, you know, uh, games where it's, uh, first person shooters, Val, um, uh, of course, Valorant, uh, Paladins, Smite, League of Legends, all these other games that I'm now like blanking out on. Why do we not see more of the, uh, like the practice mode where you have, where you have the ability to either go solo or have like a team of players go against just CPUs. Why do they have to be real players to do like a full match? Cause you know, you've got the tutorials that might give you a little smidge here, a little smidge there, but nothing like a, you, you can't get the full match experience just playing against the CPU. And that is a hard question. Uh, the short answer, ladies and gentlemen, just if you want a, a little bit of a spice, a little hint of what's going to that, what I'm going to talk about is AI is hard. <laughs> That's where I was going to go. It's really freaking hard. Uh, uh, I will, um, being a developer, though I haven't developed in a long ass time, I can tell you AR is, AI is hard. Um, so we'll talk about that l more next week. Um, how to fear it will be talked about. Um, but that being said, let's see here. Um, Zelis. Yep. What do you plan? Uh, Scarlet Nexus. I bought the full version. I was impressed. Yeah. Um, it's a good game. It's, uh, I like the combat. My only thing is, you know, I still find it. So you do basically combos to kind of get your smooth combat going. Yep. Between like normal basically button mashing and then like your special attack. Yep. If you do it right, you kind of chain them. I still have visual difficulty knowing if I chain them correctly. Like obviously you do damage, but you want to do like double damage or whatever your bonus. Mm -hmm. I'm never a hundred percent sure if I did it correctly. Because like other games, like you know, you did your bonus. Right. Like no. No. Yeah. Special, yeah. Special, you know, yellow light or something, whatever. Whereas Scarlet Nexus, I'm never like sure. Like, did I do my combo right? Did you not. Did you start as uh, Yuito or uh, uh, Kasane? Uh, the dude. Yeah, you did Yuito. I went the other way. I went Kasane. Um, I did her in the demo. Uh, for her, uh, I've noticed that there's like a little bit more of a flourish of like the last piece of her attack. If you, if you're com if you, you know, you're able to combo it together, but I will say this, I, 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 I too continue to play Scarlet Nexus though. I think I'm pretty much at the end of it. Uh, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I'll be very interested to see if Xelius even takes a little bit of time in the, the relationship building, which you Ooh. really need to, because 
that allows for enhancing your powers and unlocking additional uh, special attacks that you could do with your partners. Interesting. I mean, I just started. I mean, I'm still pretty dang early in the game. Let me just say, yeah. gifts are important. Hmm. Uh, and Zelius, just for you, uh, all you got to do, it, you could skip all the dialogue in Whoa. those in those relationship building things because the you're not going to get quizzed on it. Though I enjoy them because I like the story. I know Zelius is probably like that. That's that's bitchy. That's whiny. Okay, do I? Are we gonna kill anything this time? No. Nope. Okay. Cool. Ooh, I, I no, leveled up there in my so friendship. Far, I feel like I'm playing a like interactive anime. Yes. Yes. Actually, you know what it reminds me a lot of, honestly, is Ruby. Of what? Ruby. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like because you're battling the others. Like okay, that's I can't remember what the name of the enemies in Ruby are right now. Yeah, uh, but it's like it kind of that same style of like fighting the others. It's like the same type of battle with the same kind of like flourish of battle, and you got your squad, and you kind of have your different, you know, you some have the electrical ability, and some have the water ability, or whatever it is. So it reminds me a lot of Ruby in that regard. And you, you know, you're the young squad trying to prove yourself. Yeah, which is a good thing. I mean, Ruby's great. No, I, I and I I thoroughly have enjoyed uh, Scarlet Nexus uh, so much that I've put in. Let's see here. Uh, I'll give you the exact number here. It's let's, also a gorgeous game. Oh, absolutely, uh, Scarlet yeah. Nexus. I've put in thirty hours. So I've so, definitely got my money's worth on that one. So are you gonna play uh, the other playthrough then, as the dude? Mm, probably not, but it. it it will play. I could, I could tell that um, it's it plays up to a certain point. Uh, it's going to be a unique experience. Basically, you play as it. It's almost like a lot of these like uh, RPGs that have multiple characters, or hell, uh, um, a lot of the MMOs. They usually have like a kind of like a back story building thing where you're really you know you're you're beat it's it's a time to flesh out your character and those around you and then you really jump into like the super game um and so uh uh yuito and uh kasani they're they've got their own platoons and then uh at some point they come together so you basically end up you know, combining platoons, which you have to later in the game because some of the SAS, which are the special um, attacks that your your uh, platoon members can can do for you, um, you won't have available until a certain point. So in the demo, mm -hmm. you get those like right away. Yeah. Like, because I did play first, I'm like, that did throw me off because the demo, like I was doing like, full every ability combo within the first like 10 minutes and now playing the full version it's like oh which makes sense i get it they want you to kind of feel the full game um uh, but then i'm playing the full version i'm like okay they're like they're pacing it which makes sense because i went, went uh at one of the pieces you of course level up your character and, and you become stronger get more hp all that stuff but one of the things that that's huge in the game is called brain points. You gain brain points when you level up and then you yep. can put the brain points into the brain point tree. And one of the things I aimed for was the ability to do two SAS abilities at once. Sure. Cause then you can light some enemies up. Nice. But of course there are certain, uh, there are certain abilities that you cannot, um, uh, put together at the same time. Mm. Like you can't do pyrokinesis and electronesis together. You can't make electrical fire. I mean, but, technically I mean, in real world, you could. I would be OP, man. I would be OP. But, I mean, most of the stuff, I mean, you, you've, you some of the the powers, you have, um, what's up, H-A-D? Um, you have the ability to teleport, uh, invisibility, pyrokinesis, uh, duplicity, or, or duplication. Uh, um, damn, what was the other one? Teleportation, invisibility, fire, electric, duplicate. Oh, oh, hyperspeed. 
clairvoyance, which I think predicts where the enemy's going to be. And then there's, uh, oh, and then you can basically, I guess, double down on your, your, uh, your power, because when you combine the two main characters' powers, they get stronger. But anyways, highly recommend checking out Scarlet Nexus. And I'm now saying the name right, which is awesome because for the longest freaking time, every single time I try to say it, I always went with Crimson Nexus, which is not the game. You're like me, giving it a new name. Yes. Um, so, uh, I know we're basically at the end of the show, but I, I do want to, you know, uh, say that if you, once again, if you'd like to be uh, a helpful part of Alter Confusion, we do have a patron. Uh, it is two different t tiers. There's a $12 a year tier or the $60 a year or $1 a month and $5 a month uh, that make a huge difference for us. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, at this point, Zelius and I will have to wrap up for this evening, but hopefully Google Han Hangout Classic will continue to work so that we don't have to monkey around with that 60-minute crap of uh, Google Meet. But until further, uh, let's say adieu. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, oh man, I am dead. Yeah, I think your brain stopped. I have problems. Ladies and gentlemen, for myself, Charlie and Celius, it's been a pleasure giving everything over our heads, our mouths, and of course, our hearts. We'll be back next Thursday for another Ultra Confusion Thursday Night Hangout. Remember, kids, keep on gaming in the free world. Amen to that, brother. Amen.